Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Lynn McEntee. I'm the moderator today for our panel discussion for Moksha Canada Foundation. Moksha Canada Foundation is hosting a diversity festival. This is the fourth annual one. It is the second virtual. And I was lucky to be a part of it last year. So I'm, I'm just thrilled to be a part of it this year with an eclectic a group of guest speakers and panelists who will share their expertise and knowledge in the community and life's experiences. I want to take a moment to thank our founder, Sunil Channon, for um, preparing and allowing this opportunity to happen, this discussion and such. So thank you for that to Sunil Chen and Amoksha Canada Foundation. And just a little bit of, before we get started, for any of our uh, guests watching, please send in any questions that you have for our panelists, and we'll get those through as best as we can. Um, I'm just going to shout out to Moksha Canada Foundation in terms of what our theme is this year. It is a safer, inclusive and resilient Canada. Uh, so that is sort of the theme of our four week festival. We will have three weeks of panel. And today we're talking about racism and discrimination. Uh, we have four wonderful panelists and I would like to just do a brief hello. And then if you don't mind, I'd love to introduce one guest at a time, giving you an opportunity to speak for 15 minutes at a time and allowing for questions to be fielded and such. Um, if that's okay with you. So thank you. Uh, so maybe just start with um, Councillor Cynthia Lai, if you could just say a quick hello to our, our viewers today. And thank you so much. Thank you. And at some point we'll, we'll turn on your, um, your sound so you get an opportunity to speak. And Inspector Alice Tsang, thank you so much for coming as well. Thank you, giving a nod to our audience. And we have You're Queen, thank you. Thank you. thank you. And Queen, thank you for joining us uh, as well. Uh, the first time this year, we really appreciate it. Thank you. For having me. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And Asma Khan, who was part of the panel last year throughout the festival, thank you again for joining us this year. Um, so what we did for anybody who's just joining us, we had issued a question for our, our guest panelists uh, that would uh, relate to their feel, but also their passion in life. Uh, so we're going to give you a moment to, and I'm going to be introducing Asma Khan. Um, I'll just do a little bio on Asma, if you don't mind, please, and thank you. I'll get that together. And Asma... Asma Khan works as a project coordinator with Molten Women Council and as a community outreach and heart house hospice. She holds a master's from U.S. Pharmacy and Administrative Sciences and has studied addictions and community services in Canada. She also works as a Catholic family services of Peel Dufferin with moms and kids who have witnessed abuse. Asma is passionate about working with marginalized communities and is a strong advocate of diversity, equity and inclusion. The question that we issued to Asma uh, before so she could prepare and to talk about it were what are some of the key components that you believe are necessary to involve all our community as a whole and working, ever-changing, always evolving landscape as citizens? Thank you, Lynn. And uh, I always get trapped into this because my name starts with an A. So yeah. while in college and university, I have to go first. But anyways, <laughs> so this is a wonderful question. And um, I personally believe that, you know, the key components to involve all our communities. Um, the first thing is we have to have a common objective. We have to have a goal. And I, I, I feel that the common goal, the goal should be to have a healthy, um, equitable community. So a healthy, equitable community that, you know, the one that offers complete social, mental, uh, physical well-being to all its residents and at, at, at all stages. And um, I feel there are certain themes embedded in it, like affordability, accessibility, diversity, um, uh, equity, um, stability. And I feel that everybody in the community, all stakeholders, like the community, families, individuals, faith leaders, all stakeholders should be brought together on one table. Now, when we talk about these themes, uh, my, uh, you know, uh, there are two biggies here, affordability and diversity. And I love to talk about diversity because, you know, a part of my work is around diversity and I myself, uh, you know, am from a diverse background. I've lived in Pakistan. I was born and raised there. I've lived in the Middle East. I have studied in New York, you know, which is a very cosmopolitan city with so many diverse populations and then landed in Toronto. And um, I don't know, I personally feel, you know, we go to so many conferences, so many workshops, we talk about all this uh, diversity and, um, you know, and uh, there's so much information, right? But when you see what's happening around us, and then you feel like 
is there something that we are doing wrong or is there something that is not done right? Like recently, and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, um, all of you know about the incident that happened in the city of London in June. And um, recently, um, like two, three days back, and I'm, I'm very sure that, you know, some of you may not he have heard about this incident. Um, I got a call from, from a classmate, you know, who went to pharmacy school with me uh, in Pakistan. And she said, you know what happened to one of her classmates' son in London? And I'm like, no. And then they said the family lives somewhere in, you know, in some other area, two hours away from London. So this child who's turning 18 and is ready to go to the university, got admission in a university in London. And then, you know, he was there um, at night. He called mom and he said he was going out to get his food. And after that, mom never heard about, you know, um, uh, from him the whole night passed and in the morning they got a call from the police that somebody kind of assaulted the child now this boy is in the hospital critical um, in coma uh, they already did a um, you know surgery on his skull so and we are all praying so where is the respect I mean there's all this information around us where is the respect where is the tolerance? I personally feel it is time for us to talk, teach, preach, and practice around respecting each other, tolerance, understanding the similarities that we have. I was reading an article a couple of uh, months back. I forgot, you know, where I was reading the article, and it said there are more similarities between, you know, uh, amongst us than uh, differences. So, you know, uh, like learning about those similarities, appreciating those similarities, right? Accepting differences, right? So are we, are we on the right path? So I've been thinking about this since two nights, you know, praying for the boy and we just had an update that he's still critical and, you know, he's in, he's in coma right now because he had a stroke. So, you know, this is a very uh, kind of a sad um, uh, incident that has happened in the city of London again. And uh, yeah, so that's one thing. And then I also heard about, you know, some of the, uh, some of our Asian friends, you know, from, from China and Hong Kong that they were kind of, you know, had some rude comments about COVID virus and all that. So that was again sad. So where is the tolerance? I mean, the world can never be like, you know, I was at another workshop and I said, if, and I believe in God, that's why I say that, that if God painted the whole world with one color, would it have been beautiful? No. So different colors, different foods, different festivals, different cultures, different languages. These are all the colors of, of this world that makes the world beautiful, right? So what, you know, where, what is wrong that we are doing? There is something wrong we are doing, or there's something not right, or there's something, I mean, a lot of, there's something that needs to be done more, right? To, to, to involve our community and teach them all this and bring everybody on the same table. So that's one. And um, uh, if I still have time, I can, I also wanted to touch a, a little bit upon affordability. So, you know, what's happening? Is there like, and you know, there are financial issues with everybody right now pre and post COVID, I would say. I was in another conference and I think it was region of Peel um, last year or the year before I forgot that they were talking about that uh, the middle class income is vanishing somewhere. So the poverty line, you know, here it goes, it's going long and then there are very rich people and then there are very poor people. So the middle class income, you know, we, we don't find uh, a lot of them, they're vanishing. So what's happening? There's something wrong there as well. Is housing affordable? Sorry, no. Rents affordable? No. Can you buy a house? Somebody living here can buy a house? No. Who are buying all these expensive houses, right? People coming from, um, sorry, the Middle East, bringing money from there, right? People coming from, and I, you know, being a South Asian, I talk to a lot of families because, you know, most of my work is in outreach, uh, you know, in, um, in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, people are selling their lands, bringing the money here. People working in the Middle East, you know, uh, settling their families here, working, still working in the Middle East, bringing that money here. And then all sorts of other money, I don't know. I cannot comment on that, right? Why are the housing prices so high? Who is uh, responsible to kind of set these prices? It's not affordable. It's getting impossible every day. Yesterday, I had a chat with a family who wants to live in Mississauga. They landed in Mississauga. They have all their support system in Mississauga, but they are going to buy a house in Hamilton. And they said, it's, it's impossible. It's not affordable in Mississauga. The other thing is, you know, and um, auto insurance. And I don't think a lot of people talk about that. Why are car insurances so high? 
So is this all affordable? And you know, if, if, if life is not affordable, you know, it's kind of, it's, it frustrates people. And then there is hate and then there's anger. And this is, there is all kind of mental health issues, depression, anxiety, right? So I, I, I think there needs uh, to, you know, a lot of work to be done around that as well. I don't know, uh, I'm not a policymaker. So, and you know, uh, I don't like to be a policymaker, sorry, the, not my cup of tea. But then again, you know, this, these things need to be pushed. So as a community, if we bring all our people, individuals, like as families, youth, seniors, um, nonprofit organization, policymakers, politicians, right? bring everybody, faith leaders, bring them, them together, you know, and let's see, you know, what is wrong? Food, wages, you know, our wages are not, sorry, but, you know, not up to the mark. People are working two jobs in each family. If they're, you know, a wife, has, a wife, husband, and probably two kids, maybe, right? Wife and husband, they both are doing two jobs each to make ends meet. Is that is that uh, right? That's not right. It's, it's, it's a lot of stress to the family. Education, health, right? So these are the things that I may mean need to be addressed. And again, you know, all these things need to be addressed. Everybody has to come together. And then only we can have like a, we can involve everybody and have an equitable community, a healthy community. And that's what's uh, what we need now. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Asma, wow. Um, thank you so much. Would you be taking any questions at this point? I, I think I have a question just to start, uh, if you don't mind. And then maybe I'll see if any of our other panelists uh, wanted to jump in. Um, do you see, how do you see the landscape has changed then? I know, I think we talked about this before, uh, but even just say in the last five years, in terms of these um, things that you're talking about, accessibility um, and, and depletion of resources or not, no access to resources, if you will. Um, um, if I understand your question right, uh, yes, in the last five years, I would say, you know, uh, the positive thing is we are acknowledging these issues and we are talking about this. That is my hope. So we are acknowledging like violence against women, mental health, right? We are we affordability, accessibility. We are talking about these issues. So my hope is that we are on the right path. I was at another conference by a great indigenous speaker and she was talking about because she said, you know, the way she, she looks like, she said she can pass for a white person, but her husband, you know, he's an indigenous, uh, you know, from that community and, you know, he, he, it, it's, it's pride. I mean, you should be proud of it. But when he goes to the market and they buy something, they always stop him at the teller and start counting his items. That's not right. That's not nice, right? But like I said, the positive thing is, I am glad that you're talking about it. It's been acknowledged, so there is hope. Like what do you say that? That's always, that's that's light at the end of the tunnel. So I, I think we're on the right path, but we all need to work together as a team, as a community to make things better. Yeah. Mm, I hope I you. answered your question, yeah. Yes, indeed, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Question from any of our other panelists or those viewing today. Uh, for Asma, so we could carry on, continue the conversation, um, dig a little more uh, for a few more minutes uh, with Asma while we can. Um, Cynthia, anything you wanted to sort of ask Asma at this point? No? No, I'm good for now. You, you're Thank good you. for now? What about Inspector, Inspector yeah. Sang? You're, you're kind of, I'm good. You're good? And Queen, I'm good. I agree know? with a lot of points, right, that, um, mm -hmm. you know, well, very realistic, right, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as immigrant, right, you know, uh, we see those problems with especially the lady landed people, right? It's harder for them compared with 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, life is changing, more compact. People are very different. And then I, I was so happy to hear that um, the words you use uh, at least a couple of times is respect. Yeah. I think that's, that's very important, right? Like uh, now these days, I find that a lot of time we you know, we're doing a lot of stuff, but when we think about it, it's all about respecting each other's rights and each other's needs. Mm -hmm. Like sharing those that you have with anybody. I think, you know, if everybody behaved the same way to show some respects to help people, we can make a bigger impact into our community and then to mentor the youngest people too. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, Queen, did you want to ask anything at this point? I don't have anything to ask, but you did say something a couple of times is what are we doing wrong? And I just want you to know that there's nothing that you're doing wrong and that the work that you're doing is just so validated and acknowledged and um, such a privilege to have that energy in this space. Um, it's everybody else who's still doing things wrong. So <laughs> it's the 
work that you're doing that moves us forward. So thank you for that uh, introduction to the work that you do. Thank you. And and the last thing I wanted to say is, you know, I, I, I am a parent myself and I talk to a lot of, of course, you know, people in the community and parents that, you know, have we forgotten our values? And because I work with hospice palliative care and I've done a lot of grief support groups in the past, uh, you know, especially for the South Asian community. And I so I got that opportunity to work with a lot of faith places. And my God, you know, I went to the Gurdwaras, the Sikh Gurdwaras. I went to the mosque, you know, I am a practicing Muslim myself. And I went to the mandirs, masjids and, you know, churches. And every faith is so beautiful, right? And everybody teaches the same thing. I mean, like, I didn't find a faith that talks about, you know, go and kill people or, you know, cheat people or, you know, be disrespectful. So every faith is so beautiful, such lovely teachings. Last year or no, the year before, before COVID, right, I had that opportunity to connect with the Buddhist temple. And my goodness, such calm and such peace. So then why, again, like, you know, what is wrong when everybody's teaching the same thing? So that means we have forgotten our values. We need to bring that back, you know, and teach our kids teach the community, we need to bring them back. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate that. Anyone uh, viewing today that would like to ask a question at all? I'm not looking in the chat. I'm not seeing anything there. Uh, if you're sending in anything Facebook Live, perhaps that can be teleported to us for, uh, for dispersing that question to you. <laughs> Um, great conversation, great kickstart to uh, Moksha Canada's Foundation Diversity Festival uh, Panel 1 uh, for August 7th, and we're very glad that you're joining us today. Asma, I'm learning and growing with you all the time, so thank you again for being a part of this panel discussion. Really appreciate it, and I'd like to take a moment to introduce our next, our next panelist to join in on the conversation. Uh, and Queen, did you want to take this one? Um, I'll, go, I'll do a little introduction to you, uh, please, and thank you. Um, I'll just be a moment. All right. So I'll read a little bit of your bio, if that's okay, Queen. So uh, Queen is a dancer, teacher, actress, singer, choreographer, marketing, social media guru, and a TEDx international speaker. Queen is the CEO and owner of the Queen Company, launched in June 2020 as an arts and marketing company. Co-owns the Heels Academy with her partners Michelle and Vanessa. Runs Soka Dance Hall Afro Dance Classes. And I, I've met, uh, I've seen Queen throughout the community, and I'm just um, was really happy that she's about to join us today on this panel discussion. We issued a question to her, and the question was: If we begin to try to understand the difference between discrimination and racism, how do we learn grassroots ideas and apply this move for change? Yeah, what a hefty question to be sent, you know. Um, I really had to think on this. You know, I have like, these great roles and businesses that I get to do, but my work with the Guelph Black Heritage Society and the work that I get to do in activism and advocating, it really um, had me stepping back and looking at, at this. You know, grassroots has been really implemental for organizations, for coalition, for critical masses. And I think, you know, something that Asam, um, Asma said is, you know, we saw so much devastation in so many different communities this year, whether that was Black Lives Matter, whether that was my Indigenous brothers and sisters, and you know, I'm so grateful as a Black settler to be sitting on these lands that I am today on Turtle Island. Um, my Muslim community, like week after week, we were having protests and vigils um, in my city constantly for this white supremacy and violence that was constantly hitting communities. And I think recognizing the space in which community building is so implemental and important um, to the work that we do on making a difference in discrimination and racism is how we really have been moving forward and how we've really been seeing so much change. And I mean, grassroots can be at so many different levels. It could be the work that you know, small organizations are doing to helping our community in need from homelessness and food insecurity and the list goes on and on. And it could be just organizations that help with the LGBTQ2A plus community. There are so many different ways that we can give back in a grassroots um, manner that has really created kind of this difference and understanding of like eliminating uh, racism, which I'm not sure I'll ever see in my time. I'm not sure I ever will, um, but what has changed is I'm not wearing the burden that my ancestors wore and the youth after me are already starting this work at like 12, nine years old. I'm seeing the wildest things out of youth that they really shouldn't have to be doing. They should just be able to be youth, but 
you know, understanding part of this question, you know, you posed was if we begin to understand the difference. And I think what's really important to reflect on is not if, but when, because if you want to see change, you must be the change. There is no other option, especially at the crossroads that we're at in this kind of um, not only community here in my city, but across the world, we're seeing so many things happen um, from climate change to protesting on so many different levels. Um, and creating that awareness and space within yourself internally that, you know, people always say, you know, one person can't make a difference. And for so long, I thought that, you know, for so long as a struggling teen who didn't see myself for so long, I was like, there's just no way I can be that person. But every person can make a difference and even a small way that can really um, amplify the grassroots community that can really amplify messages of those that can really help spread awareness and most importantly education. You know, at this point, it's really starting with the education is really key, right? Protests on street are wonderful. Um, I've I feel like I've partaken in like 20 in just this last year and they make a massive difference, but a lot of actionable and tangible change happens behind closed doors. A lot of people forget that, don't see that, don't see the extreme amounts of tireless, passionate work that goes into um, activism in any manner, whether, um, you know, that's the mom at home just, you know, trying to protect her kids or whether that's someone in an organization trying to like lead the forefront. Um, right now we're in a position too that constantly people keep asking me about grassroots organizations and this anti-racism work and this anti-discrimination work. And I keep being like, y'all know this existed 10 years ago, five years ago. We've had so many different steps in community plans from city plans, community plans, organization plans, um, board plans, school board plans, um, all the way down to policing plans on ways that we can implement change and no one did it. It's not like we actually have to create the wheel. We just have to keep the wheel turning. And so right now I keep telling people, you know, don't lose that momentum. But right now I'm really demanding of people to look for that tangible change that they can do through social media. Um, you know, social media has really made it abilities for grassroots organizations to keep themselves connected, whether that be through Instagram or whether that be through other programs that be. Um, it's allowed us to kind of stay connected and stay organized in ways that we never utilized before. It allowed for accessibility on a whole new level. You know, people forgot that when COVID started, asking a Black person to walk outside of their house with a mask on was like a whole nother level of traumatic, traumatic experiences. We have to recognize all these different kind of spaces on how people feel and all that takes is listening. I cannot tell you how many times in my life I've been in activism for 15 plus years and how many times people would clap back at me, question how I'm feeling, question what I've gone through, question, oh, that can't be true. Like that's just media. And now what has shifted not completely, but what has shifted is that people are starting to listen. They're starting to tape back and like, just take a breath. I tell my dancers this all the time, take a breath, like allow that space for clarity for everyone, whether that's the person who's telling you the situation they've been through, that can be extremely traumatic. I mean, I could tell you a list of stories from people I've lost along the way. Um, really, really good people. And just this week alone, we lost somebody else to violence. And it destroyed me inside because I was like, this is why I don't sleep, people. This is why I don't sleep because by the time I sleep, somebody else we've lost. And we've seen the numbers rise to near 6,000 to our Indigenous communities and residential schools. And that weight and that burden that people carry can be so extremely heavy. So it's really important that when we ask that it takes all of us, it means that all of us are in taking that burden. It allows space for those who are doing this kind of grassroots work to eliminate discrimination, to take a step back and also have time for themselves to heal, allow time for themselves to grow. I don't know everything. You know, I didn't come out of my mother's womb understanding anti-racism. And I tell these two, particularly white folk, a lot of the time that feel like as if I might be attacking them. And I say, you know, whether my words and the way I'm coming might seem strong, it's coming from a place of 
frustration, anger, tons of grief and trauma. And it's not to tell you like, this is your fault. This is telling you, I also am doing the work. You also need to do the work. I had so many ways to eliminate racism in my own brain. I was born and raised in Canada. I was born in a Canadian institution. I lived and grew in an adoptive white home. I very much was in a privileged standard of what our lives were. Those glasses have now come off. I'm seeing more intersectionally, but that took work, a lot of work. There's like hundreds of books and a whole nother two bookshelves of constant reading that I'm doing to try and keep up. And I think at the end of the day, this movement isn't just a moment. It's, it's just not. And when you say it's political, it's just not. Those fundamental ideas are what colonialism has built into inside our head onto what is right and what is wrong. And it is up to us to challenge that, whether people believe that's radical or whether that's actually implementing change, right? We, you know, just looking at this set of panelists, if we talk about suffrage, we wouldn't have been able to be on this set of panelists without the work that women, queer and trans did to have our voices heard. And that is the exact same thing we're moving towards. We just wanna see a change. Um, the system isn't broken. It was built a very specific way um, designed for um, the removal of indigenous and black communities. And then the war on drugs that hurt, you know, our Asian communities at a, a ridiculous amount. And then that grew to our South Asian communities. And then the list went on and on on ways that we could affect racialized and marginalized communities. That does not mean that BIPOC or what racialized and marginalized means struggle. You know, so often that is our narrative. There is so much more to grassroots organizations that include joy, that include positive energy, that include music and dance. You know, constantly we're seeing on the internet cancel culture. And I'm like, culture is beautiful. There's ways that we can embrace culture in such a healthy way um, and accepting people and whatever beliefs they believe. You know, before you go judging someone else, why don't you look to the mirror for a hot second? Take some internal work, you know. It is up to us. Our community has always been about protecting and serving each other. And we need to get back to those roots. You know, there was a point in time where all that humanity was, was existing without these institutions surrounding them. And we continued to survive and we continued to thrive through that. And I think some of these, you know, institutions might hold structure that is important, but we have to start looking at making ourselves uncomfortable within that structure. It's important to apply pressure at constant amounts. And I think that that's where we're always learning from grassroots organizations is that perseverance and resilience has always been at the forefront of the work that we do and love. Love has to be at the work that we do. You know, my girl Nazar, um, Nadia from Guelph once said to me, nothing good in act nothing sorry, let me rephrase this, nothing good brings you into activism. Um, and then I was like, okay, so what is it that keeps us here? And it is that love. And Skylar Williams from 1492 Lambach said, you know, we got to start loving the hell of each other, like all the time, fearlessly and without doubt. And I'm keeping that energy with me is that even through that anger, we can find love. And that's what grassroots organizations have been doing and that's what keeps them going. So um, I hope I covered enough and haven't taken up too much time, but uh, thank you all for your time, space and energy. I love that. that uh, wow, that's awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Got a love sign there from Asma there. Uh, totally there. It's, it's been there all along, as she said, and it's just a matter of um, uh, we're sort of reinventing the wheel, I guess, if you will, right? Um, I wonder if we could take any questions uh, from any of our other panelists or other participants that are watching. Uh, take a moment. Uh, you said it covered a lot there as well, so thank you. Uh, Cynthia, um, Councillor Lai? Yes, uh, actually, I don't have a question, but I do have some comments uh, regarding um, your deliver your speech. Uh, uh, your name is Queen, Queen, like That's a queen, true. right? That's a good name, actually, yes. Um, <laughs> I really, it really kind of hit home when you said something about, you know, the glasses have come off. I mean, to be a visible minority, I think 
it is very important that the glass came off or come off. And I'm kind of starting to worry about my children. They are, they are born here. They look Asian, like they look Asian, but they're Canadian, Canadian, they were born here. So I think we need to really do a lot more to help them to, uh, to kind of be proud of the identity. And uh, it's not an easy task, but I think, I think they've kind of somewhat lost their identity. And my nation, you know, uh, my heritage is Asian, but I'm an, a Canadian. So I think we need to do more on those uh, fronts in order that we can, uh, you know, they are our future generation and they are our future. And I think at the end of the day, I think, uh, you know, 50 years from now, I don't think there's any, it might, all the heritage might have been lost because I don't know, it depends on how they will treasure their heritage and different people and everybody will be Canadian. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, just, I think we need to work a little harder on that one. Yeah, thank you. You're, you're, you know, you're so right. And I think what part of that is, is our mentality needs to change. For so often we were calling ourselves the visible minority, but that meant we were invisible to whom, but really we're the global majority. We are the global majority period. And we have a right to take that culture, that religion, that belief, that heritage and own it. And for years, we've been told to rip that apart from us. Mm -hmm. For years, we've been told to rip that culture. For years, residential schools happen, the 60s group into indigenous communities, and those same things happen to other cultures as well. And now it's, a, I think, you know, for your kids and for my, you know, age group and younger, they're really seeing the depth of which the importance of reigniting heritage is and seeing us now as the global majority. We're not just racialized, marginalized, visible folks. We are the global majority. We hold it over and um, we should be very proud of that. Mm -hmm. I certainly agree, for sure. Uh, interesting that you had mentioned that, uh, Cynthia, Councillor Lai, uh, teaching uh, newcomers as well. I know often uh, children or families would want to change their names um, to an English name, and I would often say, you know what, please don't. Um, please don't do that. If you don't mind, just kind of keep your original name if you don't mind. And I even noticed when I was studying Mandarin um, in class as well, a lot of the students with me was um, were students who were trying to speak to their grandparents because they were losing their culture. Um, so that was interesting that they were they were revisiting that. So very much so. I, I totally agree with all of the above. Um, yeah, beautifully said. Thank you. Anyone else wanted to jump in there before we? We certainly have lots of opportunity to to engage and discuss here. Queen, that was lovely. Thanks so much. Amazing. Thank you. Alrighty, folks, I just wanted to remind everyone that you're watching Moksha Canada Foundation's Diversity Festival. It is the fourth annual or second virtual one. Um, and Moksha Canada Foundation is a nonprofit organization. It's all about engaging and connecting our communities together, which we are doing here today. If you're joining us live, um, please continue to join us and raise the bar and raise the conversation on a grassroots level. I'm going to be introducing, uh, who would like to go next? Uh, Inspector, Inspector Sang? Yes, sure. Yes, let's do oh. it. Oh, welcome. I'm just going to read a little bio, if you don't mind, please, and thank you. I'll get that together. Um, in 1995, as the first Chinese female officer, um, I, sorry, I'm just getting a little bit cut off there. So thank you. Um, has worked as a patrol uniform capacity in the CIB Homicide Intelligence Duty Office, currently OIC of Diversity, Equality, and Inclusion Bureau. Current volunteer work serving as board of director for the Cultural Bridge Initiative which delivers activities programs to youth and seniors to prevent isolation caused by cultural differences. Please welcome Inspector. First of all, on behalf of uh, my organization, Chief McSween and um, the 2,300 men and women who serve the community, thank you for the opportunity uh, to help us to once again have, you know, have strengthened or put a little bit of um, effort to uh, connect with the community. And this is obviously not going um, towards the community in York. It will be a, a wider community. So, you know, let me uh, um, share a few things like of what we are doing actually, like, you know, from um, our police force. So, uh, some people may know, some people may not know that actually, you know, uh, the Regional Police Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office has been working for a long time. I myself has been in the office for seven years, so I'm still in a learning mode to um, 
help out to, um, you know, to bring out some new values and to work with the community and help to bring back, because I have the most compassionate um, feelings for the, the general public people, right? On the one hand, we have this profession that we were taught to enforce the law. That is basically for public safety, sick of it, for the traditional believing in policing. But now I'm seeing more and more what important is the psychological safety feelings for any citizens as well. And that piece is relying on our work with the community. And um, like, um, you know, when we begin our police work, you know, at the college, you know, they teach you stuff, different stuff, different ideas, different knowledge. But one thing, you know, that I think everybody should remember that who are the police? Police are actually the people and people are actually the police. And uh, I always uh, tell my um, younger officers that don't, don't forget, eh? you have a family who might live in your region. I live in your region, I'm a citizen as well. My family live in, the, in your region. So what type of police services do I want to see when we need help, right? So it's a two way street that you bring the stuff in to help to implement the future for our community because we want to feel safe in both ways, physical safety and public safety. Uh, and, and, the, and the feelings of like being safe. Um, very, very simple to understand because I, you know, I, 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 of course I was from Hong Kong and then I have an opportunity to go to England to, in, to, to study in a boarding school a long time ago, I'm talking about almost like 30, 40 years ago. But at those days, what happened is as soon as we open our mouth to speak with an accent, you get picked on, right? So we are being so discouraged to even to learn, right? Um, now, today, the COVID thing bring the same thing to the Chinese community as is because of the circumstance, right? A lot of people were told to go home, right? So where's the feelings? Am I able to walk down the street to feel safe? So I ask, I question myself, if anybody come up to me and say, I don't, yeah, oh, okay, I don't feel safe walking. So I think, you know, we are not doing enough, right? We have to self-reflect and say, what else can we help? Because we have this uniform on. It's not just about, you know, bringing the strict enforcement piece right into the community. So for my team, we really advocate and try to build a cohesive, cohesive and an inclusive community. We, we want to constantly increase trust because we, we believe one thing, Together, we are more, not alone, okay? Um, we always, always, like when we develop our like strategy and technique and method and programs, we always see that, like especially for your region, we, we see it, your region is a microcosm of the world. When we look at ge geographic factors, we have uh, around 1.2, 1.3 million of people living, right? Um, we have more than 120 different languages and dialects speaking by our people. And 47% of the people are immigrants in our region. So how are we going to serve the community? How are we going to work together to respect everybody and then to understand their needs? So things need to be done, right? With policy, with strategy. Don't forget, you know, it's based on, you know, we have to make everybody happy. And sometimes I say it's very simple because, you know, these are all our bosses. These are all our tech players. And, you know, they deserve the service. Um, so there are a few areas. You send me two questions, right? I kind of answer the first one. It is important because if we're not doing enough or doing it good, we're not doing our job. Uh, the second piece that you have asked me is what are the areas? Okay, so the areas, you know, there are a few really big focus. The first one is internal training and training for the community. So we're constantly um, upgrading our values and our training into our own people, our recruits. Um, I see that like, you know, because 
my office also push a lot of education out, right? You, you think about sometimes as a police officers, if you are not, um, you know, constantly, you know, uh, doing the traditional work, your, your own people will say, you guys are not doing police. We had that, okay? It's a challenge, right? Because it's also impact our performance and because we didn't look down, right? So we're gonna change it, flip this and say, no, you know what? You know, a lot of time I say, you know, when you study for your promotion test, right? You have a book called Community Book. Everybody has to read and study it and then to pass the test. But what happened is, you know, after the, after the test, you pass it, a lot of people just close the book and dump it and totally walk out from it. And I say, this is not right. Now you see that 50% of the policing work should be community work, at least, right? Um, so we, we have different program um, trying to uh, uh, push and promote like inclusivity values. Right, we know that like, you know, we, we, uh, externally, we're trying to focus like uh, with our recruiting, we, recruiting pro program, we go to different community, uh, cultural group and try to constantly recruit the people to go in because we need their skills, we need them to understand how police work and then pushes the educate, pushes our police values out and work, uh, it, it just work, right? And brand in and then, you know, you see everything growing, right? And then um, a lot of time with like, you know, special investigation, you know, homicide. Um, you need people who understand the culture, but let's say uh, in the Chinese community, there's a homicide, right? You better have investigators that do understand certain culture, okay? But, uh, but at the same time, I say diversity community work is also important is because same cases, if you're dealing with a special culture group who, who suffer a loss, what are the sensitivities pieces that as a police officer, you have to understand, right? So they need education. Our new recruit need education. This is so, this is what part of my office do, right? So, uh, and then normally like, you know, like they are at least, you know, a, a, a few hours a day. What, what also we, we will focus is to work with different faith and religion groups. There are over 300 places of worship like in our region. Um, we try to keep a good relationship with them. We have created a program called uh, Places of Worship Tour for every single one of our recruits. Um, we will take them to at least different main religions like the Muslim, the, the Coptics, the Buddhists, right? drop it as a day, as a tour, to take them, to introduce them with the basic values that like different religions group um, believe in. And that will help them to get them started. And then when they go back on the road, like on their first day, they're driving in their area. If there's a Buddhist temple, if there's a mosque, they can go in and visit them. So this is how we keep our relationship with them. And then we, we always like extended our reading to them. Um, we, we bring their religions leader to our headquarter, like, you know, every, you know, let's say once a year or twice a year like, to meet with our senior command, right? So to, to keep building the, um, the relationship with, with them, right? So one thing very important uh, is we don't believe in an exchange of the business card when things happen. We believe it, like, you know, you should exchange your business card when nothing has happened, the relations is already there, right? <laughs> and something happened is they, they will trust that the police will do the work for, for the people to help, right? Not just like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're begging for help, right? That's, that's to, to us is like, you know, it, it doesn't sound right. Um, then another very important value that we, type, we try to teach our member is to develop, this is what uh, we call the global mindset. Basically is to get ahead of knowing the issues. For example, during the Middle Eastern conflict, right? We have to know ahead of time what is going on there because that event due to global, uh, globalization, 
our citizens here will hear about it in five minutes, right? So we will know what to anticipate the changes, what are the needs now, right? We're dealing with that or certain group will start to, you know, have a little bit of conflict. So we need to deal with it. Or we need to reach out to them and say, I hear about that. Uh, are you okay? Right? If you need help, you know, you know, we are we are around. So we 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 see this piece of work like like you know as very, very important um task, uh, a daily task. So, you know, like for example, another example is for the covert, you know, we know about the Asian community will get impact. So we will be doing a lot of different strategy, like working with them, uh, extending our our program, um, you know, going out to do a lot of like education speech um, talk to different uh, community Asian groups to ensure that we are here, you know, for the support we're here, like you know, for the for the safety concern, and then like you know, also you know, to support the the anti-black racism, right? We as a result, like you know, we create a lot of uh, listening opportunity to create internally a lot of like committees, right, to listen to the needs of the community to work with them to, to help them. Uh, and then also with the LGBTQ, we, I, I know that I like, used to join with the Toronto Parade, but you know, we are working closely with the, the young LGBTQ community like prefects. Um, uh, 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 and, you know, we supported them. Uh, we, we put a lot of action um, together. For example, I don't know if you guys know that uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe about a, a year and a half ago when you know, people deliberately drove through some intersections which have the rainbow crosswalk and damage it. Yeah, as a result, you know, we, we investigated very seriously and at our safety village where we have in Stouffville, we built um, a crosswalk. So, you know, like to show our support and we mean it, right, with, with, our, with our passion. Um, Another example is uh, uh, a while ago when the uh, Yazidis group arrived like in Richmond Hill, Markham area, we extend our support. We went out and meet with them. And then, you know, uh, although, you know, there's language difficult, difficulty, but then after the first time we celebrate their new year, second time, and guess what? Now, when so happened, like, you know, these kids are around and go to school, one time when they have a, an opportunity to visit our safety village. And guess what? That Those kids remembers me and holding my hand and say, you know what? Um, last year, when you came to our party, I have no idea what's going on, but now I speak English. And I remember you, right? So, you know, these are the, we planted the seed. You may not see it immediately, you know, for, for the, uh, like for the results, but you know, it is a good thing that you know to keep us happy, to keep us going with, with our idea and with our action. Um, also, one thing very, very important that uh, uh, with YLP values is we believe in the uh, developing um, on the human rights mindset. We work around and respect the, all the grounds of Ontario human rights. Um, so, uh, uh, also at our police uh, safety village, like we try to develop some program. We have our, we, we first, like, you know, about a year and a half ago, we finished our human rights classroom that not too many police uh, agency has, okay? So that classroom is for any groups or education um, that um, people want to come to, uh, teach like, you know, or, or, or make education in relation to human rights, the indigenous like education, um, any concerning those like values in human rights values, you know, they are allowed to, you know, book the room and, and come use the room. Um, we have developed some little program for kids, you know, it's an online program because kids used to come to our community safety village a lot, like, you know, like it's during school year. Um, we have developed some reading stories program that fit uh, the needs of kids to help them to develop concept on respect, sharing, loving. And I believe those are basic human rights, really 101 course that we could help to support kids for their growth. 
right, towards um, believing in your human rights and respecting people. Uh, for, you know, the traditional, like, uh, focus, public safety, uh, my team also look after uh, hate crime investigation and hate crime um, prevention education. So, uh, as I mentioned, not, not only, you know, internal education we do, but a lot of extension, like, you know, with, uh, let's say, for example, the municipality bylaws office, right, we give them training and help them to understand what is the sensitive and effective way to deal with um, um, hate crime or hate bias incidents where you find graffiti, like, you know, uh, racist uh, language uh, that's um, being painted, right? How do they respond to it and respects, right? Um, to the, uh, you know, to, uh, to the concerns group. So these are, these are the stuff that um, like we normally look after. Um, so I just want to um, close my uh, information by you know, promoting really the belief on together we are more. We, we work with a lot of like stakeholders, um, for example, with Human Rights uh, Commission, Canadian Civil Rights Liberty, uh, different places of worship and different culture groups such as like Moksha and uh, with uh, you know, the culture beach that you know, I, I serve on the board, like many, 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 many different stakeholders. Um, so we, we hold hands like because police cannot do it alone. Um, so uh, finally, uh, just to quickly mention that we do create a lot of like uh, events like right, to bring people into our facilities to celebrate. Like we do celebrate like Black History Month, uh, Asian Heritage Month, uh, Indigenous Month. Uh, and then we also create something very interesting. It's called the Citizenship Ceremony. We actually reach out to the citizenship court and bring the whole court to our headquarters once a year. And then each time uh, we have uh, at approximately 100 new citizens who get sworn in at our police headquarters. And then like, you know, with a couple of their families attending to celebrate the big, the big day of a, of a person like arriving to Canada for a new life. Um, then like, we do have uh, you know, uh, different religions and culture celebration just such as the Manoa, you know, and then we have a Halloween in the village and holiday at the village. So those are different programs that we create like, you know, annually to, to keep up um, with the connections uh, with the community. Uh, so that I could sit and, and talk for the whole day for, you know, in details, but these are the, the basic values and concepts that YLP has um, for the community. So if you guys have any questions, I you know I try my best to answer. The That's questions amazing. That's amazing, Inspector. No, thank you very, very much. We've actually had a question from one of our, our uh, attendees. I'm just trying to pull it up. As a York region police, what strategies are you using to educate community about diversity? I think you've covered a lot of that. But, um, you know, you've talked about education and sort of uh, planting the seed early on and all many different prongs of the community. But if you wanted to enhance it a little more from one of our participants, they're asking about diversity specifically. Well, I, I, I believe, you know, diversity to me, the definition of diversity is um, it works equivalent with inclusivities, right? You respect different, the differences of people, then you also extend to in to allow them to respect them of their own belief and values. So you're including, you're welcoming everybody. Um, it, 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 it's, it's like, you know, like, you know, now you, you see, you know, with, um, I think, you know, I have been with the police force for almost like, uh, well, 26 and a half years, something like that, right? So I see the changes, right? When I first got on, you have mentioned I was the first Chinese female, mm -hmm. okay? And then at that time, why my workload was so heavy because there was nobody speaking the language. Yeah, yeah. But now, wow, you know, you turn around, you see all your coworkers, you know, it's like a microcosm of the world when you go to work. <laughs> right? So it's not only respecting the differences, you're embracing it. So it becomes like, you know, inclusive, like everybody is welcome. So I think I, that's the that's the main you know strategy as I you know uh, and then also you know with the global mindset and you know uh, believing in in human rights 
-hmm. right? So, so we are trying to, you know, improve and and catching up with the needs of the society constantly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think, as you mentioned, it it's, uh, starts with education and coming from the education field as well. I think planting the seed early on, and all of our participants would agree that it starts with respect. And uh, in order, you know, in order to get, you have to set the tone for that, and that starts very early on. Yep. Um, yeah, for sure. For sure. Thank you. I think there's another question here. Pardon me. Um, yeah. No, I think we're okay for that. From one of our panelists, do you have uh, wanted to add to that at all for Inspector? We have a few more minutes for that. Yeah. Think, uh, yeah. Councillor Lai? Yeah. And, yeah. I just wanted to echo on some of uh, Inspector Zhang's uh, uh, comments and, and it really kind of, I concur with what she's talking about, more, more importantly about physical and public safety. And as a city councilor, we, you know, in the city always care about the social services for our residents and, and the physical safety with the COVID and all that. And then, you know, public safety with the policing and all that is very important that two pieces. And I think you really put it in a very good perspective right there. And the other thing I kind of wanted to echo on is about, you said that when you were in England, every time you speak English with an accent, you got picked on. I got to tell you, to this day, I still have language barrier. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been almost 50 years now, and I don't need to speak, then I don't, I won't speak. It is because I'm still not very impact. comfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm still not very comf comfortable speaking because of that barrier that I have to overcome. I try very hard and I've improved. And I think, uh, you know, uh, Lynn, you, 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 you know, you were teaching ESL students and all that. And it's very, very important to teach them the confidence. You know, they should have confidence and don't be afraid to speak up. And, and that is a very hit home point for me. You know, I've almost 50 years now. I, to this day, I'm telling you, I still, I still have some, some form of a language barrier. So I just wanted to echo on those two points. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor. I appreciate that. Uh, Queen, to add into that? Yeah, definitely. I feel like I'm a tough pickle for you to crack. Um, and while York Region, and I appreciate the work that is being done by you and your officers, we're not necessarily seeing that work diversely spread out. Your uh, Peel Region has a high rate of you know, lost lives from policing. And when we talk about public safety, I'm wondering where we hold accountability for other police officers in the work that they're doing to not protect and serve. And how do we continue that same mindset and education into other policing forces when policing is built off the backs of the removal of, you know, indigenous and black bodies from this country. So I'm wondering how that mindset shift and I know education is really something of importance but when we look at something like Peel region um, when we look at somewhere like Hamilton the recent attack in Barrie um, it's disheartening to feel any trust um, to even the, the the uniform alone right that alone can bring up severe trauma for people so I'm wondering where you see policing in terms of accountability going from here um, you know, like once again, you know, uh, I can't stress enough like about education and also educating other police forces, right? Um, what we have been doing is we have been working very, very hard and there's different committees or even like, you know, uh, among diversity team from different policing that like we do get together, right? Uh, in fact, like uh, w my team is uh, organizing a, a summit, right, for the diversity officers in, from different police forces across Ontario to come to York. So we are trying to like, no, not show off, but showing, you know, what we are doing and um, sharing with them that, you know, um, things that have worked, right? And then have some discussions, um, you know, among like different teams to exchange ideas. Um, so hopefully through those communications, um, you know, they will, that will trigger their creativity to maybe further some um, advanced program for their own community. But like, yeah, they, they do, they do calls, you know, often and then we exchange like information. What are you guys doing? And what are you guys doing? And another thing is like very important is, is support 
like during the um, the previous, like early in the summer when the most of his um, family was killed in London, Ontario, right? You know, we, we went and, and support the police forces and we went um, there to support uh, the family and then to uh, uh, visit the, the mosque where the, the, the victim's family like, belongs to. So that's the support, right? We, we get to show, to show that, okay, like there's an extension of love and respect, um, not, not, not only to, uh, in that case, to the, to the family, to the community, but also, you know, to our colleagues who um, has to uh, deal with the, with the situation. So, um, yeah, I, I know, you know, like um, there is, of course, you know, because of, of different um, council or different municipality, it is a little different, but I believe that, you know, the police act and, you know, the regulations and uh, the procedures are, are, are very similar, right? Um, it, it's, uh, it's the different needs, but I think soon, you know, if they see a needs of the community, they will uh, um, make up more uh, program to meet the needs. I think uh, the more we hear, you know, you need a vision, but as I say, the global mindset, like these terms help, right? It's help you to look further, like down the road, what is coming. And, you know, it, I, I think, you know, it, it, it's only um, a matter of, of time that they, you know, like they will develop something more, like maybe perhaps more soil or, or expansion of, uh, of, of the unit itself, because we, as I mentioned, we started very early, like 12 years ago. Um, so it, it takes time to learn and build up the experience. Uh, at one point, like, you know, we spend a lot of time at just attending events. Like people feel that, like, you know, we just go out for dinner and lunch with the community, but it's more than that. And then we, we already have that established, but now we're moving, moving on and say, okay, okay, what do we see is education work. So we kind of like shift the office a little bit also, like, you know, based on educating the people, the more we can do, the more the better, right? Doesn't, doesn't matter who, but, you know, uh, uh, perhaps not only focusing on the newcomers, we also focus, our beauty focus is any vulnerable people. As, as we see that anybody could be vulnerable, right? So <laughs> it's everybody, everybody has needs. Um, that really is what Moksha Canada Foundation is about. And that's why we're here today, uh, your guest experts, guest panelists, and we appreciate your contributions to the conversation, raising awareness. Uh, sometimes it's really just taking a moment to uh, appreciate all of the work that we're doing in our communities. Um, I do have one question, actually, um, again, coming from the education field and just sort of in this region, um, a different region in particular, they're removing school officers. And I wondered about your comment regarding that. Do you think that that's a, a good thing to do or would there be a good way to revisit that in the future? That kind of uh, I mean, I, I can't comment on that, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. I, I know I'm community services, but I actually belong to the diversity side, not the school side. There is mm -hmm. a, a school resource section that um, mm -hmm. another inspector look, look after it, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have enough information to Unfortunately, to to answer you that question, uh, but I, I but I think the police is always there, but maybe in another format, right? Like you know, we, we strengthen or develop our youth program or something, right? Um, but we always there. Thank you. Question, Husband. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the, in terms of diversity trainings, so I'm very interested in, in learning that when we say the term diversity trainings, what kind of trainings uh, does the police get? Like say, for example, I work with palliative care, right? So we do provide diversity training. So what I recently did was, um, you know, I am bringing in speakers uh, to talk on end of life cultural practices in the Buddhist community, in the Muslim community, in the Hindu community. So I'm bringing a spe speaker from that community to teach our staff, volunteers, and other service providers, um, you know, about the end of life cultural practices. So when uh, the care providers go into a home where death occurs and, you know, that families from a diverse uh, community, we don't make mistakes. 
Like I think, you know, so a few years back, there was a, a not saying that it was done intentionally. It was just as like, you know, uh, like a mistake because of lack of awareness. It was a sick gentleman who was dying. And then, you know, because, uh, you know, a beard is a sacred item to, to the, uh, you know, sick uh, community. And, uh, but the nurse uh, was not aware and she was trying to help uh, feed him. Um, and then she cut his beard. So when the family came, they were devastated. They were like, you killed him before he died. So that was, I would say it was like, a, it was not done in, intentionally. It was lack of awareness and education. So that is what we are trying to do that bringing all these speakers and teach uh, our service providers so we don't make mistakes when we go in homes where there's end of life. So what kind of trainings does the police get under diversity? Okay, so, so in terms of like dealing with, as I say, I mentioned about homicides, right? investigation so we do i don't know if you're aware that we do have a where we do have a, a chaplain program that we have different religions leader that uh, actually our chaplain um, their purpose is not only providing us support if we have a problem right but it's, it's also teaching the recruit teaching the deaf investigator what are the things you have to look for for certain religions group how do you respect when you enter the house? Um, and I, I, I also come across with different training, you know, lately, and, you know, we have uh, some training from a, a, a Jewish, you know, um, community. So we kind of like talk about that, right? So, you know, doing these like, you know, uh, training, we do have invite them to come teach us because the, they should be the expert, not us. They sh we should be learning from them. What are important to look out when um, crisis happen to people. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, cultural sensitivity and cross-cultural training is key oh, sure. and so important. Yeah. Absolutely. No, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else at this time? Um, that's amazing. We're just building, building upon the conversation. Thank you so much, Inspector. Appreciate oh, that. Welcome. Thank you for your knowledge as well. Um, standing by is Councillor Lai. I really appreciate that. And Councillor Lai, I wanted to read a quick bio for you, and then I'll read the question that we had sent out to you so our viewers and listeners will know what we were um, setting you up for today. <laughs> um, thank you very much, and thank you for your patience. Uh, Councillor Lai, um, work hard, live well, and give back with an exclamation mark. This is the mantra by which Councillor Cynthia Lai has lived her whole life. And it's the wisdom from the mantra that Councillor Lai has gone from poverty to prosperity and now to a city councillor in Toronto City Hall. We're welcoming, welcoming Councillor Lai today. Our theme this year is Safer, Inclusive and Resilient Canada. What does this mean to you and what role do we have as citizens to engage in creating a safer, inclusive and resilient Canada? Welcome Councillor Lai. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, for the kind introduction. I actually enjoy being the last because, you know, there's uh, some saying saying save the best for last or last but not the least. So I do enjoy it. But uh, and uh, that being said, I also would like to thank uh, Sunil for the invitation to join all of you today about a subject that is so close to my heart and affects so many of us in Toronto and Canada namely racism and discrimination. Before I begin, I want to thank the Moshe Foundation for organizing today's event. My understanding is that this is the fourth year and uh, of the diversity festival and it is the second year that's being held virtually due to the pandemic. And we do have a lot of new norms. So I think it's very good that we have to adapt to some, some of these uh, measures. And I read with interest the goals and aspiration are for the foundation and, you know, and this festival and uh, the desire to connect, the ability to create and being able to participate. These are all action oriented and participatory goals. They are, they are to be commended. I mean, the foundation is to be commended. And this, the theme for this year is a safer, inclusive and resilient Canada. This should be a goal for all of us, not just those who are racialized or marginalized. And for question number one, what does it mean to me? As a first generation immigrant to Canada in the 1970s, I came to Canada from Hong Kong for a better life. And Canada is supposed to be founded 
upon the values of multiculturalism, openness, and inclusion, and has zero tolerance for racial discrimination. But in real life, I worry sometimes that we are not inclusive enough. As a nation Canadian and a person of color, I have lived and experienced a recurring theme of racism and discrimination in Canada. The challenges that I've been encountering in my countless stories are not unlike many of yours, rooted in hard work, resilience, and perseverance. I faced and continue to face many of the challenges and issues you all do. It had created a strong person I am today. And I just wanted to share a few stories to illustrate some of these points that I just made, some good and some bad. In my previous life as a realtor, I was one of the 10 women and the first Asian woman to be the president of the Toronto Real Estate Board in its 100 years history. I spent 10 years serving on different committees to allow grassroots members to get to know me before I got elected. And that is hard work. Second story I'm gonna share is, I was also the first Asian ever serving as a director of the Real Estate Council of Ontario, representing the Toronto Regional Real Estate Board, elected by my peers for three consecutive terms of nine years. I tried to get elected to be chair of the board, but failed twice because the vote was casted among directors and not by grassroots members. And then I decided, well, I'm not gonna be used that nine years, that's it, I'm gonna be move on, right? Because then, then I was encouraged by my mentor, Councillor Norm Kelly, who had retired now. So I applied and was appointed as one of the members of the city's committee of adjustments in 2010. But I wasn't reappointed in 2014. Although I have the real estate expertise, as well as there's a huge Chinese population in Scarborough, guess what? That motivated me to run for city councilor. And that was not my first time running. I ran in 20, 2014 and I run as a, uh, I run the provincial election in 2004 around that time. But at that time, my children are small. So I thought I, I should be a good mother to make sure they grow with my love. And, and then, so I stopped. So the second time is 2014, I ran, I lost that time. And this time I made it. And you know, my son on Facebook was congratulating his mother. It takes perseverance, commitment, and persistence. Congratulations to my mom who made it to city councilor. And three is a charm. Like, you know, he said that three is a charm and you, you did it the third time. So these stories illustrated that to me, nothing comes easy and make you wonder whether there's something to do with my ability of being a person of color I like to give it the benefit of a doubt. What does racism and discrimination mean to me? It meant that it took blood, sweat, and tears to not only breaking the glass ceiling, but also what I call the bamboo ceiling. Second question I was given was, what role do we have as citizens to engage in creating a safer, inclusive, and resilient Canada? Anti-racism is one of Canada's most important values. The federal anti-racism strategy acknowledges the need for the government of Canada to combat racism and discrimination. I want to relate the work of the Toronto City Council in this regard. A recent meeting of council gave me the time to pause and reflect on these issues because we were dealing with racism and hate in different forms and with different communities. I moved the motion to establish a task force to condemn anti-Asian racism after the Atlantic shooting earlier this year, which was passed unanimously. 
It is modeled on the work of the confronting anti-Black strategy uh, that the city established several years ago and has done very good work. Hopefully a report will come about and for more recommendation to embrace inclusiveness. Toronto has a slogan, for those of you who don't know, diversity, our strength. To me, diversity is a fact, but inclusion is a choice. Every citizen, including you and I, being one of the many victims, play a key role as a citizen to stop racism and discrimination. I just wanted to give you uh, some examples. There are no inferior or superior culture in Canada. My girlfriend's daughter actually who married a Portuguese perform, uh, performance artist wrote a song called Toronto. It was the lyrics saying, Toronto don't care where you're from. Choose inclusion. Inclusion starts from all of us. How? By walking the talk. First and foremost, we, should, we shouldn't discriminate or have any form of unconscious bias against others. Canada welcome all immigrants regarding, regardless of where they're from. There are three ways, I think, as a role of a citizen that we can actually contribute. Number one is to raise awareness. We've discussed about it earlier. And we need to acknowledge that there is racism and discrimination first. And then we need to publicize this, me uh, this message and maybe market the history and facts of communities to the community and to the broader public. And, you know, there's been a lot of discussion in the Chinese community about the recent, uh, you know, uh, Atlantic killing about Asians and all that. And I said to them, there's no point talking among yourselves. You must tell the broader public, right? No matter how mad you are, there's no point just discussing among yourself. So we need to show up and we need to mobilize movement to find allies. That's very important. Number two, I think we need to provide education as uh, Inspector Zhang was saying that there's need to be internal training. So I'm trying to get the city to make sure that city staff are being trained to serve different cultures and different communities, just to educate them and to make sure that they all know how, you know, cultural differences and, and all of that. And also we, we need to educate our residents not, to not be afraid to speak up and to report incident before they turn into crimes. And then, you know, we need to, the police will need all this information to, to do investigation or to lay charges. And we need data, we need data just to make sure that we're on the right track. And we need to work together to educate one another and encourage citizens to speak up and stand up. The number three point I wanted to, to talk about is that as a role of citizen, we need to celebrate the diversity. How? I just wanted to share you some examples so far and what it means to me that I've done. Again, in my past life as a realtor, I founded the Asian Real Estate Association of America, which is an American uh, association for networking. And I had a tagline tag saying, you don't have to be Asian to be a member. So meaning that we're just not playing in our own sandbox. We have to play with others. And it's very, very important that we mix to, you know, our network and kind of you know, <clears throat> do the best that we can. And the, the other thing is that I, as a counselor, I created an event that promotes art, culture and heritage with cross-cultural community development in my ward as a first-term counselor. I'm just thinking of how we can actually do this. You know, just walk the talk is very important. So I created a Asialicious Carnival in 2019 and it's a weekend of food and fun in my ward at Woodside Square with the theme, flavor in food. So they have a night market full of different food, different types of food. Well, we focus more on the Asian one. And then we have a, the other theme is flavor in art. We have visual and performing arts. 
And I actually just finished 10 bell boxes. I've uh, used some of my budget to have 10 artists paint 10 bell boxes with murals in my ward. So it would be, this is, would be visual art that I have been doing. And flavor in, in music. So we have song and dance and we have a starry night, you know, and I'd actually, because of pandemic last year, we did it in the drive-in format and we couldn't, uh, we couldn't have any, uh, you know, audience that come from uh, outside of the Canada because of the pandemic. So I had to fill in as Councillor Lai and friends. So we had fun together and we actually got the only fireworks license in Toronto last year. Because I told the police chief, it's about time we have to salute to the frontline workers. So they, I mean, being a salesperson, so they, they you know, I, I sold them. So they, they did it because, you know, I don't, I don't want it to gather, you know, they are worried about gathering. So there's no gathering. We did it, you know, uh, according to the TPH uh, protocols and all that. And flavor in fashion, that was the fourth theme. So we will promote local Asian designers. So those are the themes. That, uh, that I think that we should, uh, we will do it annually. And because it's a success, after 2019, we planned to have a Asialicious TO, just like Summerlicious and Winterlicious, but it will be happening in the month of uh, Asian Heritage Month in May. But due to the pandemic, it was actually postponed till September, which we had very lucky, we were lucky with that, that uh, part that was not locked down. So we postponed it to September. So what we did was we were hearing that with some malicious and Asialicious, there were no restaurants participating, maybe just a handful of restaurants participating in Scarborough. So I want to change that. So I, I sent my staff out there to talk to people, to work with people. And we signed up 170 restaurants across Toronto to sign, you know, to participate in that, in this Asian versus TO. They are all Asian restaurants, you know, because, because sometimes they have language barrier. They don't know how to communicate. So I thought they, these are the vulnerable group. You know, we were talking about the vulnerable group. I, I, you know, I take them as one of the vulnerable groups. So we have 170 restaurants participated and 35 restaurants are in Scarborough. So that's the difference. In closing, as a citizen, we must advocate equality, respect, and unity. I've been living in Canada for almost 50 years. Looking back, the path I've taken and life journeys I have traveled. Immigrating to Canada was one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. Canada is second to none in terms of its tolerance, diversity, and respect. And while Canada is one of the best countries in the world and we can still make it even better. Regardless of where we're from, we are all Canadians. We build Canada together. We need to stay together to get together as more, quoted from Inspector Zhang. Mm -hmm. Work together to take legitimate action against any form of racism in Canada. Standing shoulder to shoulder and be part of the same cause for ourselves and future generations. We have a job to be a role model and aspire young leaders to step up. Racism and hate have no place in our community. They must be condemned, but they also must be reported. And we must work together to educate the community on what it means to be an Asian Canadian, Black Canadian, to be Indigenous, to be a Jewish, to be a, a Muslim, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, LGBTQ. We must educate them to be proud of their heritage and proud of their faith. And that is what it gives this country and this city its greatest strength. Together we are stronger, stop racism, stop hate. One of the ways to create a safer community is to turn hate to harmony. We must all improve our commitment to inclusion by acting on this topic. With inclusion, it comes resilience. We still have a long road ahead of us, but Rome is not built in a day, but it can always start today. I look forward to collaborating with Moksha Canada to fulfill our goals and make a difference. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Councillor Lai. Much appreciated. We have a few questions. There was actually one gentleman uh, who asked a few questions before for inspector as well. So I'll just give one to you right now, Councillor Lai. It's from Brian. And Brian's on standby. He wanted to know what the city is doing for the Indigenous community. Um, if you have any opportunity to speak on that. Well, there's a department we call the SDFA in the city. And they deal with a lot of social services that they do deal with different uh, uh, communities. And yes. I wasn't on the community committee, so I'm not really having firsthand information. If you can get me the uh, your contact information, I'll have one of the staff from the city to tell you firsthand what they are doing in the indigenous community. Community. That's lovely. Thank you. See if we can set that up, Brian, if you're listening. And Brian has a couple other questions. I'm just going to toss them around, whoever would like to jump in. Um, let's see. Uh, the Asian community first needs to work on reducing our own colorism and the anti-Black discrimination. If we discriminate, and you were speaking to that as well, the uh, inclusion and um, you know, standing shoulder to shoulder, Councillor Lai. Um, if we discriminate other Asians based on their skin color, how can we be expected to be good allies to the Black community? Well, this is what I said. We, yeah. First of all, Walk the talk is you do not discriminate any community. I said it in my speech, regardless yes. of your faith and your, your color and your heritage. So the black community is one of them. So I've included that we shouldn't discriminate in any, any community. We have to be, we are all Canadians, so to speak. Great, thank you, Brian. Uh, for sending that in. And um, Anu has just commented, thank you to Moshe Canada Foundation for creating such a safe and inclusive platform where we can um, have such courageous and much needed conversations. That's from one of our uh, people following. Uh, any questions for Councillor Lai from our other panelists? No, I think, yeah. Anyone else at all? No? All right, I wondered if I could just um, ask our panelists if they had a closing comment for you in terms of words of wisdom moving forward. And I wonder if you can just have a thought about that. Um, what are your words of wisdom moving forward on working together as a community, standing together shoulder to shoulder? I'll take a moment to, with an outgoing message. And Councillor Meyer, I'll go with you first, please. Well, I like to start by saying that we should have a global mindset here. And we are the global, with the global majority, as someone said it and put it here. And it doesn't matter where you're from. And it, we have, you know, the world is a global village now. So we can, we can, we should all work together and we, we should not be saying where you're from or, you know, which heritage are you or which faith do you have and all that. Everybody's entitled to their own faith. And, and I think we should be treating everybody the same. And, uh, if we can work together, like I said, it, there's a long road ahead of us, and uh, but it it start you know begins with me. If that would have the mindset I wanted to get everybody, you know, everything starts and begin with me. Thank you. Oh, I love that. Thank you, and that's a domino effect. Hopefully, after that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Inspector. Any I words would of begin, I would begin right with the word of uh, humble. Humbly learning, humbly working with each other. We all dealing with each other because we are human beings. Wow, right there. Queen. One of my cheerleaders always uses the quote of Harriet Tubman that every dream begins with the dreamer. And for me, I see a dream where we're in a place where this is a decolonized nation. You know, we've talked about Canada a lot today, but who's Canada? I see a future of racial justice and, and um, you know, appropriate recognition of the genocides that have happened to our indigenous community of, you know, um, taking actionable steps of, you know, decolonizing ourselves and working towards being more intersectional, um, more accepting, act with love and act with purpose. Lovely, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. And Asma, words of wisdom. Um, I would say love and respect and teamwork uh, and just being, being human, that's all. Mm, that's certainly what I felt today is that human touch and human connection with our communities, thank you. 
Appreciate that. And we're wrapping up the Moksha Canada Foundation's panel one discussion today. And we have a few more to go after this, but we have been so fortunate to have amazing guests that have not only taught me, but yourselves as well. And as we're moving forward, we can carry this conversation on in whatever circles that we're traveling. Uh, if I'd like you to reach out to us on social media, if you can, Moksha Canada Foundation, give us a like and follow us. And certainly if you wanted to reach out with any questions, I could link you into some of our guest panelists if need be, if they were open to that, as such as Councillor Lai has suggested we can send in that question that you can forward on to uh, one of your colleagues as well. Uh, thank you for being a part of this conversation. I would like to read off the panel discussions upcoming next week. We're doing a uh, panel discussion to overcoming adversity and rebuilding post-COVID. That's on the 14th. And Saturday the 21st, we're doing understanding and accessing support for mental health and youth from a youth perspective. Um, please support Moksha Canada Foundation and please support each other. And most of all, take care of yourself. And thank you for being a part of the festival today. Thank you. My name is Lynn McEntee. I'm your moderator. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. And enjoy the weekend. Thank you.